warmer. How is everyone? Frightened. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, good. Good. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, are we rolling, guys? Yep, everything's rolling. So that's good. And the recorder's rolling. Yep. <clears throat> well, um, welcome along. It's, uh, we're here because... Uh, where is she? Yeah. <laughs> that lady there invited us. And as a, and you <laughs> and usually we go where we're invited basically. So so you can thank Jacinda for that. Jacinda for that, sorry. Yeah. And uh, and that's the whole reason why we go to any location is basically we go to each location because we've been invited to come and uh, we do myself and Mary do everything that we do for for free so and by now many of you might have been handed some DVDs is that correct yeah. yep so um, they're, they're for free as well we we actually um, are able to do those DVDs because of the, do, the volunteer effort of Lena who's over there on that camera and Igor who's on this camera here and Joy who's in the middle and Joy who's over there that's that lady there and uh, um, and also through the donations that come from other people before we come to a place. So, so what we do is uh, if we receive donations, we turn them into DVDs of these different seminars and then we give them out for free um, as we go along. Um, myself and Mary, we both live on uh, donations that are received um, and so that's the only source of income that we actually have is, by, is living off of the donations that people, people give to us. But we don't expect any person to donate and, and, if, please, and please don't feel that just because you've received DVDs that you have to donate because our, our policy basically is that the truth is available for free and we're happy to give it for free. We just rely on the fact that sooner or later there'll be some generous people who give us enough so that we can live and that's we live very comfortably we have a single bedroom uh, house now <laughs> that's being pulled apart as we speak and um, and we live on a little 40 acre property that i bought uh, five years ago before we even began doing this and after a while, I spent all of my money um, doing this for free and, and we couldn't do it anymore for a short period of time and then people started uh, donating to us so that we could keep doing it and now we get enough donations to do this full time all the time. So that's what we do. with, uh, And so we travel, as I said, to people who ask us to come to their location. We don't actually market anything. We don't, uh, we don't try to generate an interest in a certain location or anything like that. What we do is we just go to where people have invited us to come. So where we've come from last weekend was that there was a couple in Albury who invited us to go to Albury and we finished up talking to about 80 people there actually. Um, and just from before then, we were down in Melbourne because some group of people in Melbourne invited us to go there and we were talking to about 50 people or so there. So that's been our trip this time. We've come into Melbourne, driven, driven up to Albury, driven across to yourselves here in Mildura and we'll be driving back to uh, Melbourne tomorrow and doing one more session in Melbourne on Saturday before we go home. And this lovely lady, as you must I be just, aware... Yep. I just wanted to say hello. I'm Mary. I'm not going to join AJ for the talk tonight, uh, as I usually do, but I just wanted to thank you for having us here in Mildura. I think this is a really awesome venue. It's really lovely. Yeah, so... Thanks for having us. It's much warmer than, Mil uh, than Albury. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> it was freezing in Albury. Yeah. I think one day it was like five degrees for the whole day, so it's just pretty cold. Yeah. <laughs> and blowing a gale as well. Yeah. So we're happy to enjoy your warm climate, actually. <laughs> um, myself and Mary live in near Kingaroy up in Queensland. That's where we live. So, And, uh, and the way we did this trip is that uh, Igor and Lena volunteered to drive down all of our sound equipment. So they drove and we, we, we got taken to the airport and we flew down. So that was really good. Normally what happens is myself and Mary travel around in our car with the back of it full up and, and we do all of our sound equipment by ourselves. Um, but uh, this time Igor and, 
and Lena wanted to come with us too. So that was really, really great. Okay. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now, I suppose the first thing I should talk about a little is how much media attention we're getting at the moment. Um, some of you have probably seen that. We've been... Um, it's all started Friday, actually. Uh, sorry, last Friday. If someone would like to just open that for somebody who wants to come in. Um, there is no other way in other than there, is there? Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Welcome. Um, what was I saying? Media. Oh, yes, that's right, the media. I, I want to forget it, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's been happening is that uh, on Friday, this guy rang us up from the Sunday Mail, and uh, I, don't, I don't know why he rang us up, but he rang us up and said, look, we want to find out what's going on. He, he did a very, very short interview with me for about three minutes, actually. Um, maybe five minutes. Uh, and... Um, he then put that, we had to do some photos, which we did, and, and he didn't put that in the Sunday Mail. And since then, it's just gone nuts, uh, really. Um, and then the, and so we've started to have some media follow us around and so forth, which myself and Mary, um, I'm probably okay with it, but Mary's been struggling with it a bit because we don't get much privacy and there's a lot. We've, our email accounts now are full of, um, very angry, mostly Christians swearing at us, um, which is interesting in itself. Um, but uh, yeah, very, very angry people with me just because of claiming to be Jesus, basically, um, without really investigating anything that I've said to them. And my expectation is that it's probably going to continue uh, for some time. And most of the people who... Uh, they are asking to be on uh, we don't even know they're sort of third hand people from people that we've met so it's very very difficult to respond to any question about you know what we're accused of without knowing the details of what we're accused of basically for myself and Mary we only have a desire to share the truth what we feel is the truth with others we don't expect you to believe it and we don't expect you to do anything about it if you don't want to also, we don't expect you to um, change your life if you don't want to change your life. But what happens for a lot of people is they hear these truths and for the first time in their lives, basically what happens is that they start feeling a resonance with them. You know, they feel like there's a lot of questions that they've had through their life that all of a sudden they're getting answered. And as a result of that, they they then start to feel like, well, no, this sounds like really good. So even though we can't accept that, G that Jesus and Mary are telling us these things, most people feel, they, most people do feel that uh, what we're talking about with them has a lot of validity. validity. And, and also we answer through that process many questions. Now, normally when we first come to a location like this, we normally leave it open to the audience to determine what questions get asked and answered. Um, so what we'd love to do is to answer any of the questions you have. You can answer, ask any questions you want about myself and Mary's personal life, about, um, about the divine truth that you've actually heard already, about the soul, about different things that have happened in your life spiritually. You can ask just general questions. Uh, just, we leave it completely open. What we do ask, though, is if you're going to ask a question, if you could use the microphone, because that because we're recording these things, um, it gives us then your full question being asked. If you don't want to see the face, if you if you don't want one a person to see your face on a video on YouTube or something, if you're asking a question, just put your hand up like that, and Igor will actually cut you out. So while your voice may still be present, you won't have your face in the video. So if we make that the arrangement and that means that you don't have to be known by your friends and family if that's what you wish is there anyone who feels that if, if they ask a question they don't want to have their face shown because if you just put your hand up uh, Lena who takes those camera shots will be able to see who it is and she won't take camera shots of you everyone's fine yeah okay no worries 
So that's basically, basically us. That's what myself and Mary do. We've been doing this together for three years. I've been doing this for nearly seven. And, uh, and as I said, um, I enjoy this process of meeting people, just going along where I'm invited to go. That's the only places I go generally. And just answering people's questions is generally what I do, along with uh, sometimes speaking about specific subjects. So sometimes an audience wants a specific subject to be discussed and I discuss that with them, and that's what we do. Um, is there any, the, is there, all of you know where the toilets are here and all the basic things? The toilets are out through that door to the right. Um, we'll be having a break around probably 8.30. Um, no, no, it'll probably be about 7.30, quarter eight, something like that. Um, and some of the ladies I noticed have brought some food. Where is it? It's all... All seems to be hidden. <laughs> oh, is there a kitchen out there somewhere, is it? Oh, okay. Where is the kitchen out there? Uh, oh, out through here and then around, is it? No worries. <laughs> I wonder where it the food's all gone. What's going on? <laughs> That's no good. <laughs> so we'll enjoy that about uh, probably, if someone could just let me know when it's about quarter to eight or half past seven about that time. Okay. What would you like to know? Uh, can we have the? We need the microphone first. So, so Jane's got the microphone there. So, hi, AJ. <coughs> How did Mary and you meet? Um, you mean in this life or the previous one? Okay. Uh, in this life, Mary and I met in her parents' lounge room. Um, what happened was that her parents, who were favourable towards me at the time, uh, invited uh, me to come along to some gatherings that they had organised. So that organised a group of their friends to come along. And there was about 25 or 30 people there. And uh, Mary had just come home from Lebanon. So she, she was living in Lebanon and overseas for nearly four years. And she came home. And, uh, and they had arranged uh, for a meeting at the time, was one day or two days after she had arrived home. Three, three or four days, sorry, after she'd arrived home. And, and I met Mary then. Um, I felt who Mary was straight away, uh, which really freaked me out. Like, so as Mary will tell you one day, um, she felt that I was quite shy and, uh, and wondered why I was so like, tongue-tied when I was around her. And she wondered whether I was so tongue-tied around everybody, if that was how I was with her. Um, so that's, that's how we met. Um, I, I didn't say anything to her about uh, who, I, I, who I was, but her parents had already told her that, I'm, that I was saying that I was Jesus. Um, but she, I never said to anything about what I said to Mary anything about what I felt about her. I felt that she, there was a number of reasons why. Um, I felt that she'd just you know, come home for a start, she'd just broken up from a relationship and I didn't want to interfere with her grieving process and all of those kind of things. And so I didn't actually say anything about, about who I was to Mary or who she was. Yeah. Yeah, is, did, is that enough detail? No. No, okay. So I could feel that. So. When, when did um, you reveal to, to Mary and, and tell her who she was then? Um, I didn't, actually. Yeah. Um, and in fact, with all of the four, 14 who have returned to Earth, I don't generally do that at all. What happened for Mary was that... Um, uh, I had friends staying with me and I went home and of course I was quite thrilled for the, that I'd met my girl uh, after 40, a 40 something year break from her and so um, I, it was all, it was a, even before I met Mary the soulmate issue was always pretty prominent in any of the people who were around me knew that AJ was pining for his soulmate pretty much and um, and so I'd worked through a lot of uh, emotions and feelings and eventually I got to the point where I felt I could continue my life without meeting her, um, but I still had a strong desire to meet her and that's when I met her. Uh, and I actually thought I would meet her soon after I got to that point. Um, and then, um, yeah, I, 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 I didn't tell Mary at all. Um, what happened instead was that some of the... Some of my friends who were staying with me at the time guessed that, uh, what I felt. They, um, I just said, oh, I've met my soulmate to them. 
And they, so then they started trying to guess who it was, <laughs> of course. And of course, one of them eventually did guess who, who it was because there was only 30 people at the previous meeting that we had. So, um, so and that, that woman actually went and told Mary's parents. And Mary still wasn't told at this point. And then Mary had decided that she was going to go back to Lebanon. And Mary's parents sat her down and told her. Yeah, so I didn't actually tell her um, anything about who, who, you know, the relationship that we had, basically. Yeah. So, is that enough detail? Uh, are you, are you, you going to have a family? Are we going to have a family? Um, probably. Yeah. Can I, if we, can I just add uh, Mary might like to add a few things. Just, just let Mary add a few things first. Uh, even after I was told, it didn't mean that I believed it. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, although I did have a very strong gut reaction immediately that I was told that I knew it was true, but then I quickly suppressed and denied that because um, I felt very afraid. Um, I felt that... Uh, saying that you're Jesus would mean a lot of ostracism. Ironically, some of the stuff that we're experiencing now, and I was very afraid about that from the beginning. Yeah. Um, and uh, what happened is in the coming, in the three or four months after that point, AJ and I spent some time together, and I actually had a I didn't believe even that he was Jesus at that time. And about four days into us um, staying in the same place, I had a very strong emotional uh, memory um, about him actually being Jesus and um, dying, being my husband and dying, and um, which really freaked me out as well. And in the coming months, I had, uh, or quite a number, five or six of those kind of memories of different things come up, uh, and I became very afraid. So I, I ran away from him for about six or eight months, maybe. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and it has taken us a long time to form a relationship of any um, quality, I would say, of a love relationship because I've had such a great deal of fear. It's yeah. really been a, 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 in the last, I don't know, six so or eight I'm months. I'm quite amused at times yeah. of people who say that Mary's been manipulated by me into having a relationship with me because at the end of the day, the opposite is it's very much the opposite. Mary didn't really want to have a relationship. I never pursued her. Um, I sort of let her make her choices and decisions. If she wanted to see me, then I'd see yeah. her. If she didn't want to see me, then I wouldn't. And uh, I'm fairly uh, feisty kind of a person. It's, yeah, so uh, I actually uh, was quite angry with AJ. Um, and I resisted and rebelled a lot. Um, and it's only that I felt so strongly that this was a truth of um, who I am and who he is that I have um, gotten over a lot of fear. Yeah. I'm still working through the fear, but I desire yeah. the truth more. So, yeah. 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 Uh, just saying a sec, there's something wrong with the sound there. If you could say that again for me. So, who is Mary? Mary, this Mary. Mary is Mary Magdalene. Um, she, she was my, um, she, she's my wife in the first century. Um, we, we were married and, uh, Mary was actually pregnant with our daughter when I died in the first century. Yeah. yeah. So, so this isn't actually recorded in the Bible? Um, there's suggestions of it in the Bible. Um, but no, it was not recorded in the Bible books that were retained in the biblical canon. However, it is inferred in many other books that were written at the same time but those books were not included in the Bible canon. So, so the people in, at, at around 300, BC, uh, 300 AD who actually decided what would make up the Bible went through a series of books that had been written a few hundred years earlier, not, not when we lived, but a bit later. And some of those books refer to Mary quite strongly as, as my partner or my wife. And, and some of the books actually mentioned that I used to kiss her and so forth. Um, but... But other books did not mention Mary hardly at all. 
and the, the, the different copyists who decided what would go into the Bible at the time decided to only include the books that did not say much about Mary at all. However, in the Bible, in the book of John, there is some references uh, to the beloved of Jesus. Now, most people view that as the Apostle John, when in reality um, it's actually Mary. Um, so there was a lot of inference uh, in the Bible, but, but unfortunately, by the time they decided what to be in the Bible, which was 320 or so AD, 320 years after our lives, or a good 250 years after our lives finished, after Mary's life finished, um, by that stage, um, there was a lot of distortion about our lives already in the written record. And as a result, they decided to leave Mary out of the record. And in fact, uh, there was a lot of reasons why they chose to do that. It was a lot to do with ostracism towards women and a tr an attempt to control women through religious forms and so forth. So it, there was quite a number of very strong reasons to leave Mary out of the record. Yeah. So, so you have a feeling that connects you to your past. Does Mary have that same feeling? Yes, as Mary just mentioned, um, she's had many hundreds of different memories about her past, and uh, and she is still going through a lot of those memories now. For myself, um, I've had obviously hundreds of memories about, uh, well, thousands, I'd say, about my past. Um, but what's happening for me is that uh, many of my memories are not as intense to feel as, as Mary's going through at the moment. So Mary's going through quite a difficult time at the moment, going through lots of different memories, memories about things that I've actually remembered and already processed. But we don't... We haven't discussed much of the memories together. Mary didn't want me to discuss with her the memories very much at all, and especially initially, because she wanted to have her own experience and have her own memories. And it's only after she's had her memories that often we discuss the events then. Yeah. So we have memories independent of each other. Is How many other people on the planet are there like this that, like you say, you're souls travelled from one body to another body? Uh, it's not really like that. Um, do you want me to explain what it, what it is? Yes, please. How it happened? Yep. Uh, that'll be fine. Um, can everyone see this board very well? I know it's, the lighting isn't too good today, so we'll just turn it a bit around towards the light. I'll just get that out of the way a bit. Um, if you can picture yourself when you... If I, I'll go through the process of the incarnation process. So God, who has masculine and feminine qualities, has created millions and millions of billions, actually, of souls who also have masculine and feminine qualities. And, when, and this is in the, one of the DVDs you have. I've actually explained a lot of this in detail. Um, it's called The Secrets of the Universe in the, in the DVD set that you've been given. And when the soul splits at incarnation, it splits into the two halves. So there's usually the female half, if you like, and the, and the male half, and I'll probably draw the other way around. So the male half, they, they're two sides of, of the same soul, you could say, and then you've got a spirit body and a material body that's created at the time of conception. So on the male side, there's a spirit body and a material body that's genetically created through the procreation act. So spirit body and a material body. And the female side is a spirit body and a material body. And those bodies then become the way in which the half of the soul interfaces to the universe or firstly to the physical world but also to the spiritual world and those bodies right with you at the moment so at the moment you have a physical body but you also have a spirit body as well right at this moment and also that is attached to one half of your soul and your half of the soul is masculine half of the soul and so that half of the soul now can experience things. And what it does is it eventually passes into the spirit world and progresses if 
if it desires to progress in love it can progress now what happened with myself and Mary so if you can think of this one as being Mary and this one being myself or we are the same as you exactly the same there is no you know that there's no I'm not God or any of those other things that people say that I think I am or anything like that I'm just a man exactly the same as you are but as you progress in love you get to the point where you progress through these dimensional existences or spirits call them spheres and you progress so much that you finish up getting to, into a condition of love which is in the eighth sphere or the eighth dimension where you become at one with God and when you become at one with God, and this is what I refer to in the first century, is a process of being born again. If some of you who are religious would know that um, I talked to a man called Nathaniel um, and uh, about, about the process of being born again. In, sorry? Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, Nicodemus, yes, sorry. And, uh, and in the process of speaking with Nicodemus, I was thinking about my guide right at that moment, sorry. Um, and uh, in the process of speaking with Nicodemus, um, he was a, what you would call, he was basically a Pharisee. And the Pharisee, Nicodemus decided he wanted to know a little bit more truth and we discussed it privately but he didn't want others to know and so we we discussed it in private together and he asked me about being born again and and I taught I, well rather I talked to him about being born again and and the process of becoming at one with God so and in, so that process happens between the seventh and the eighth dimension does that make sense so once you go there and you can still continue to progress and as you progress the two halves of the soul get to a condition of joining again and once you get to that condition of joining again you are able now to connect to another body if you decided to do so on the earth and that's what myself and Mary have done but in the process of doing that you also then absorb all of the emotional injuries that the parents and the environment have when you do that so that's why we still have to go through emotions ourselves does that make sense so so we incarnated first 2000 years ago then we progress to that point and then you can decide what to do with that and we got to that point around 1935 and uh, and then it was just a matter of waiting for the right time and for a few other people to get to the same condition before we came back to earth again so when you died and between 1935 where were you um in the spirit world doing this progression all the way through the spirit world uh, yep so, so you don't do any progression when you're in the physical state no you can and this is one of the things we want to teach people is that you can do progression in the physical state the problem is that most people don't do much progression in the physical state because we we finish up engaging a lot of um like what you would classify as sort of evil intentions and emotions and in the process we often degrade in the physical state does that make sense so so but we can progress in the physical state as much as we can progress in the spirit state exactly the same in fact so you can actually progress through these dimensions these are remembering all conditions of love and you can progress in these dimensions or these conditions of love to the point of at one moment with God while you're on the earth and and you can progress beyond that you can actually progress to the point of a soul union state while you're on the earth a lot of Christians think that they're uh, uh, they become as one with God <coughs> would they actually be in the seventh and eighth sphere or would they be thinking they are um, the majority the problem at the moment is that there is nobody on the planet who is at one with God um, there's many who think they're at one with God or who think they're God um, there's quite a lot of people in the new age movement who think they're God um, and there's quite a lot of people who believe they're at one with God but the reality is that uh, if if a person was at one with God they would have had just as much an effect on the planet as what I had on the planet in the first century when I was at one with God while on earth sorry you did yeah but uh, um, the, the the actual condition of being at one with God is actually a permanent condition it's not just a um, it's not a temporary condition or temporary state yeah 
Yeah. So, so, and if we can use the mics, that'll be good. But, but the reason why it's a temporary condition is that it... Um, see, often what happens is we have an experience, a spiritual experience in our life that causes us to have an instant connection with God and therefore to have a feeling of being at one with God. But that condition does not remain permanent. And it, it, it can remain permanent. But for the majority of people on earth, it's never remained permanent because of the different condition that we are in, in terms of our emotional condition, but also in terms of our belief systems and so forth, that are in disharmony with God's truth. And if we bring all of those things into harmony with God's truth, we can actually remain in a condition of at one with God permanently, all the time while we're living on earth. So... Um, yeah, and that place is a very different place than a sort of a temporary experience that most people have had, uh, many people have had on the planet. Yeah. Do you have any more questions, sorry? Um, Christian's teachings uh, sort of say that um, there'd be many false prophets in the last days and how we would know them, they wouldn't work, walk on the earth. How do you see yourself? Are you a prophet or...? <laughs> um, well, I suppose the way I see myself is I've always been a prophet. In the first century, I feel I was a prophet and not a priest. Um, and now I feel it's just it's exactly the same. Um, in terms of determining who is a false prophet and who isn't, the Bible says uh, quite clearly that by your, their fruits you will recognise them. So in other words, how, how loving do they appear to act to you? How loving are they in their interactions with other people? Do they, are they always honest and truthful in, in something as to, to the best of their ability? Are they demonstrating love in their day-to-day -day life? How do people respond to them in their day-to-day -day life? These are all questions that are a part of working out the fruitage, if you like, or, or the kind of person a person is. So this is why myself and Mary don't expect you to believe what we're saying. We, what would be better to do would be to look at our life over a period of time and uh, examine what you believe after that. Um, and in the end, we don't actually feel that it's important that you believe whether we're Jesus or Mary or not, actually. What we feel is important is, that, is the truths that we're teaching that will help you become at one with God while on earth. Um, and these are the same truths I taught in the first century, but, but in the end, they are truths that we can either accept or reject, and we can accept them at any time in our life. We don't have to accept them while we're on earth even. We can accept them in the spirit world if we wish. So all of these Christian concepts of, you know, if you, if you pass without accepting God into your life, um, that you'll permanently be you know, uh, in a state of hell or something like that. All of these con Christian concepts are false. And as a result of that, they, um, you know, they often imply things to people on earth that, and people who pass that they can't change even if they're in the spirit world. But the truth is, you can progress from any point in, in your condition to, to at one moment with God, whether you're on the earth or not. So you don't have to do it here on earth. You don't have to make any choices or decisions if you don't want to. But, but my feelings are, is once you start experiencing God more permanently, so rather than just having a, a single experience that might occur you know, in a moment, the key is to get to the point where you're in that constant connection with God in that at one moment state. Now, once a person demonstrates that state again on earth, then other people will be able to see, oh, well, that's a really lovely state to be in, you know, and I'd like to be in that state too. Um, can we use the microphone? And uh, Do you think it's possible for everyone to be able to be in that state? Yeah. You per do? Yeah, permanently in that state. Yeah, okay, because yeah. I've, I've had, like, an uh, experience in my life where I had a calling from God. Yep. And God wanted me to heal people. Yep. Which I did. Yeah. And it was, some of them were pretty miraculous healings. Yep. Um, but he sort of didn't give me free will in, in, the, in the situation. I either had to make a choice and go on his side, or he said to me that a choice will be made for me. In other words, that if we don't hand ourselves over to Christianity and don't hand ourselves over to God, well, um, you're open slather to the devil. Can I suggest to you, and this is just something for you to consider, hmm. um, that whenever, whenever a, a person is speaking to you who takes away your free will, the person speaking to you is not God. 
the person speaking to you is a spirit who is probably claiming to be God because God never takes away our free will ever in no, it, no, no, I'm sorry, he didn't take away my free will. He either. threatened you. No, no, he, if I didn't make a choice uh, to join his army and be one with God and follow, mm -hmm. um, a choice is going to be a made, um, made for me. And God would never do that. In other words, um, I was so important to him that if I didn't go on his side, the devil was going to come in and screw my life up. Yeah, and God would never do that. He wouldn't. No. And this is, I feel this is one of the major misunderstandings about God that's on the planet, actually, mm. um, is, that, is that God herself or himself is a, is a person who created us with free will. Then to take away the free will would actually be against them, himself to do that. Free will is one of the greatest gifts that God's ever given us. And God never, in my experience, never interferes with free will. So in other words... If anybody is, in, is talking with you, interfering with your free will, whether that person be a person on earth or a voice from some other dimension, then that person is not a God, certainly not God, but probably a person who wants to manipulate you into a certain lifestyle or a certain thing that they feel they can manipulate you into. Free will, God and free will... Um, Free will is one of God's greatest creations and in fact it's one of God's greatest gifts of love to mankind. The, besides divine love, free will I feel is the next greatest gift that, we, that God has given us. Now the other thing I'd like to say is that actually there is no devil. There is no Satan or, or ruler of the demons. There are spirits, though. Sorry? There are spirits. Yes, there are spirits in very, very dark conditions. Yeah. Much darker than what many people think the devil is, even. Mm. In very, very dark conditions in the first dimension. Um, I, I agree with that. Well, I, I just want to question you here again. Yep. Um, if what you're saying is factual... Um, yep. How come for probably about four months I had people coming, walking up to me in the street from nowhere and coming straight up to me and going, why aren't you doing what God's asking you to do? I'll tell you exactly what's happening for you under those circumstances. Here's yourself, yep. the individual who the spirit is wanting to influence and the spirit is not honouring your free will. But this spirit is a very deeply religious spirit who has yet to progress enough in love to understand what's called, what's called free will. So that would indicate that the spirit is yet to even arrive in the sixth dimension, this place here. Right? Because usually by the time a spirit's arrived in this place here, the sixth dimension, they actually do have an honour of every single person's free will. Now... This spirit is not honouring your free will, but has a deep religious belief in, in God and in Jesus and those kind of things, right? So deep, deeply religious. And he, you are very mediumistic. Do you, do you understand what I mean by mediumistic? No, um, it means that a spirit is able to talk to you and you can hear them very clearly. Uh, no, it didn't go like that, actually. No, no, I don't mean hear in the sense of your, your ears. Mm. I mean hear them in terms of how they to motivate you does that make sense like um yes and no in other words it, i can feel quite a lot of spirits around you there's quite a number of spirits around you right now yeah and and they all feel quite connected to you because they feel that you are quite um, you, you are quite open to their spiritual influence, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. right? And, and this man here, he is a man uh, who's, deep, who's deeply uh, Christian in his, in his background, right? But not what I would classify the Christianity that was begun in the first century, but it's his belief of Christianity. And because he feels that he can influence you quite strongly, he at times has attempted to influence you quite strongly and sometimes even saying to you things like things that will take away your free will. In other words, sort of forcing you in a way into making a choice that he feels you need to take. Mm -hmm. now, now, one thing that um, I've been trying to encourage people to do is to, to never follow the direction of a person who wishes to take away your free will. 
because what you're doing there is quite dangerous. And I, I mean, I'm even referring, if I wished to take away your free will, never follow me. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because, because the problem with following a person who takes away your free will is that you now sort of almost abdicate your own self responsibility but not only that you're abdicating your own desires and passions and and your own longings as well it's far better if you can engage your longings and passions and desires towards god and you do it because you want to not because there's any feeling of threat upon you no, no, I didn't. I didn't. I did it because I wanted to do it. I did the I healings because I wanted to heal. And he knew that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but what I'm saying is the whole statement that he made, or the feeling that he gave you, which is this feeling that, you know, if you didn't go with him, you'd be going with the devil, like almost, almost this either or situation which you were presented with. Mm -hmm. God does not present you with. God presents you with this beautiful universe which is, which is completely free of any punishment system but it does have um, a system of um, what you would call calm, what people call karma or, mm. or what you would call correction. Um, so in other words, if I, if I decide to do anything that's disharmonious with love, there will be an automatic result on my soul that will result in pain. And if I desire to do things harmonious with love, there will always usually be pleasure associated with it. And um, that's the system God has created. What spirits often do is they have very strong concepts of God that they retain even while they're progressing through these spirit dimensions. And in fact... Uh, many of those concepts remain until they make this transition. So many of those spirits come back to earth and they, they have a very strong feeling about what's true and what isn't, even though what's, what they believe is true is not the full truth. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine, if I was here, let's say in the third dimension in my progression, I would already know quite a lot of things that I didn't know while I was on earth. Right? And what I would do then, if I'm really interested in Earth, is I would come back to Earth and I'd try to influence some people on Earth to believe the same things I'm believing because I've found out all of these wonderful things that the people on Earth don't know yet. But the problem is if I'm not aware that there's also an dimension above me mm. and another dimension above that and another dimension above that, I'm going to present what I know as if it's the full truth. And if I'm not aware of the other dimensions, I'll be quite dogmatic about that truth, like quite firm. So, so what, you're, what you're virtually saying there is that um, it wasn't really a connection with God. It was a spirit um, who, like you say up on the board, they may have deep Christian beliefs. Um, why would can, that... I, can I say, what I'm saying is allow yourself to investigate that as the possibility. Yeah, and, I, I and have. And the suspicion is this free will issue. The, mm. As soon as you see somebody trying to take away free will, mm. that's straight away a sus suspicious thing in mm. terms of God never does that, but spirits in the spirit world certainly do do that when they, in, in different conditions right up to the sixth dimension. <laughs> they will continue to do that. So, so usually, if we're getting impelled to do something from a spirit who has this suggestion that our free will isn't involved, then usually that spirit, the, the feelings we're getting are from a spirit usually from the sixth sphere or under in their progression. That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah, yeah I, I am trying to relate to what you're saying there. The things yeah. that happened in my life um, are sort of contradicting what you were saying yeah, um, that's okay my experiences and because yeah. it wasn't only people coming up to me in the street um, well can i suggest how that happens as well it's very simple for a spirit yep. to find another mediumistic person on earth by the way many people on earth are very mediumistic to find another person on earth who's walking up to you yep. and actually influence them to talk to you what they want to say to you yep. it's very very simple for that to occur and in fact this happens all the time even not only in Christian religion, but it happens in all other religious forms as well. So yep. if you go to, for instance, India, you'll find there's literally millions of people in India who have had exactly the same experience as yourself, but, but instead of it being deeply Christian, they're deeply Hindu 
or they're deeply Buddhist, yep. or, they, or they're some other walk of life. And the, the reason why it happens is because the spirits who are here can easily influence a person through this connection of dropping thoughts into a person's mind quite readily. And, and you won't hear them as a, somebody speaking in your ear. So a lot of times it even feels like it's your own thought. Um, and, and so you say it. And quite often, that can, I've had people come up to me and say all sorts of things, and, and I can usually feel or see the spirit who is with them mm. um, saying that through them, if that makes sense. Yes, it yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah. So all I'm saying is just I realise that this is going to feel a bit like... Um, Odd. Yeah, for you uh, to consider that. Mm. But just to consider that as a possibility, and the, the, what I'm saying is the... The deep suspicion is this. Whenever free will is attempted to be compromised, there is always something suspicious going on because God never does that. That's what I'm suggesting to you. Yeah. And the problem for many, I feel, on earth... Uh, can, can I give you a few other examples? We have a friend who we met up in, um, up in Armadale in, in New South Wales. And uh, I just met him for the first time. And he, he had been, he had these very strong feelings about what he should do with his life and how he should give up his life for God and all of these other feelings that he had. He actually had these two or three spirits with him causing him to feel like he had to give up his life for God and so forth. And when I asked him about the details of it, um, he could actually sometimes hear these spirits talking to him, but he thought it was God's voice speaking to him and, and so forth and so he had actually decided to give up his family and and to leave them and actually embrace uh, an entirely like different life in order to become these spirits um i suppose you could say he didn't feel it was the spirit he felt it was god telling him to do all these things but but what was happening he was he was also now like getting away from any responsibility for his family he had four children and he 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 basically had decided he was he was going to leave the family and the kids and he was going to do all of these different things and i could actually feel actually we we finished up talking to the spirits because he could hear them um, about their true intentions and uh, their true intentions was were, were, were quite a lot lower than what he believed them to be when they first established contact with him and and I feel that that happens very regularly with people on spiritual paths where they get heavily influenced by a spirit to do something, but they give up their free will. This man's name um, is... Is it David? I'm terrible with names, eh? Hey? Um, it's David. And, uh, and what happened with David was that I said to him the, most, the biggest thing he needed to learn was to feel his own desires and feel his own free will and only do what he desired to do that was harmonious with love rather than what he used to do is every morning he would he would wake up in the morning and he'd say to God this God that he felt was speaking to him I'm yours for today basically every morning he would wake up like this and he would just go ahead then and do whatever he he was impelled to do from these from from these spirits actually it worked out being in the end uh, for that particular day now he's he's rec he's recognizing that free will is like a very important issue and if free will is being impacted upon then um it usually well it definitely means that god is not involved in the process what what if there was a, a person on the planet that was so important to god um that he knew that if uh, the devil got him on his side, that ha the, there was going to be havoc and the world was going to not be a real good place. Well, my feelings is God would still allow that because of the gift of free will that God has given. So um, my, God doesn't break her rules or laws for one person. God is consistent right across the board. Yep. So if God gives a certain gift to every single person, God will, that gift will remain for every single person. Because this spirit went to a hell of a lot to get me, you know. If it's, I've if seen what you're spirits saying there. create very elaborate plans. Well, I got carried up by seven angels yep. and presented, you know, went through, the angels disappeared up through into a blue sky. Yep. 
and then the, there's a brilliant blueness and then um, I tried to look up and I couldn't look up and, and I presumed that it was Jesus or God. Yep, yep, yep. And many people have described exactly the same series of events to okay. me at some point. Yep. And what I'm saying is that, is that if we can engage these spirits more closely, you can actually see what their underlying intentions are. Now, for, the, for the many deeply Christian spirits who are living in the sixth dimension, they look very, very bright. They are impossible for a person to look at without blinding their eyes. The person in the sixth dimension is impossible to look at without going blind in our physical form. And even in our spirit form, if we're not in the right condition, we could even blind our spirit eyes as well in that process. So, so, so what happens is that many of them create a situation where a person on earth experiences something because then the person will be deeply committed to the same thing the spirit is committed to. And they realize this. And this is why, like in the Hindu faith, this happens all the time too. They actually do it, though, with very, very young children. They actually have them go through these experiences when they're very, very young, and they become gurus who then spend the rest of their life on a spiritual path influenced by a group of spirits generally. The Dalai Lama is another instant of that, where, where a person is groomed from a very, very young age by a group of spirits, given downloaded huge amounts of information um, and given... A a path to follow and they forsake their own will they forsake themselves in the process they looked upon on the earth as very powerful powerfully spiritual people but they are being heavily influenced by by spirits who are still sacrificing this gift of free will in the person they, they're causing the person to sacrifice their own gift and so this is why I say to you, just to consider what I'm saying as, yeah, a, yeah. A, as, a, as, as an explanation. Um, often these spirits, don't, they sort of have a very long-term view of life and they don't actually see it as an injury that they're perpetrating towards the individual who's on earth. They see it as a positive thing. Um, so, for example, many of you have heard of Say Baba and those kind of people, uh, in, in Indian gurus who have experienced very similar things to this. Um, by the time the person often passes, the person themselves thinks they're that person so much, but when they pass, the instant they pass, they realise that they're not the person they imagine themselves to be. And so the very first entry into the spirit world is actually very traumatic for such a person. And this is why, you know, I want, I'm saying to you, if you can at least consider it, because if, if we stay in this state where we're heavily influenced, by the time we pass and come to realise what's been going on, we'll have a lot of pretty like, sad feelings about it. We're better off realising now if something like that's happening and dealing with that now, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Yep. So it's just, yeah, just that a nice. That covers it all for now. No worries. Um, it's amazing how many times I've seen spirits in the spirit world influence a person to say something to someone else. I, I'll give you a few examples. Sometimes we're walk you're walking along the street and you can actually see a spirit talking to a man and, and also influencing a woman to look at that man so 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 they're walking along the street and for some reason they just catch eye contact and and what the spirit wants is to set up some kind of liaison with the two and quite often you see that happening as well where there's sexual liaison set up by a spirit with other people because they've been told almost impelled to do it by the spirits involved if we use the mic <laughs> sorry <coughs> what gets a bit confusing here for me is yep. um, the last experience I had with a person that came up to me um, at, at a coffee shop and she said, you know, why aren't you doing what God, you know, is telling you to do? And she was studying Christianity and she said, God has told uh, me to come and get you and take you to this church. Yeah. Which she did and it yeah. was all about spiritual healing and yeah. it was a Christian church. Yeah. So where does that fit into what you were saying? Well, there? can you see how this deeply Christian man is now influencing the two of you to go and do something that he would want you to do? Oh, yeah. yeah. Can you see that? Yeah, I can, actually. Yeah. See, he, he, he wants both of you to 
go together and do this thing yeah. he's already influencing you and he's already influencing her and remember a spirit can influence far more than one person because he's invisible mm. and of course can travel at rapid speed at any point in time so he can easily communicate that to you that to and both of you finish up having because of your own belief systems have the same motivation and it's quite easy for a spirit to create such a situation and that's why I say the danger sign is this free will that's the danger sign whenever free will is impacted upon the, the light bulbs should go off you know like in terms of in terms of what's happening does that make sense yeah you have any more questions <laughs> on Sorry? the same line um <laughs> seeing as you can see spirit aren't you saying that you can be easily influenced to be why you came here when you know um, of course. You were invited, so was she told by a spirit to invite you because of this and blah, blah, of blah? Of course. Like, into, into, of course. All of that could that be happening, could it not? Yeah. Exactly. Now, and I do so, have a question. So um, the question then I would ask you is, what, about, what am I saying about free will? Yeah. I'm honouring your free will. My free will. Yeah. It was, yes. it, was, it was her free will, but I'm honouring your free will in the discussion as well. Does that make sense? So, yeah. so if I was now saying to you, you've got to listen to me, this is, you know, and going very, very firm with you, like a, maybe a Christian minister might do, um, I, you know, obviously now I'm not honouring your free will. Yeah. And if I start sort of threatening you with things like, you will be punished, and you, you know, if you don't do this, then I'm not honouring your free will either. The truth is that God created free will, and any person who does not honour it is automatically out of, out of sync with God, automatically. They're automatically not connected with God because they're not honouring the very gift, one of the very gifts that God has given. Can you see any spirits at all? Like, um, I'm supposedly being told by a spirit that walks on my left side and holds my left hand mm -hmm. um, that it's Jesus' spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, can you cl clarify that or not? Well, what, what do you feel it is? Because I just say whatever I feel like whenever I want to and say shut up if I feel like it and yep. all sorts of things. I don't take anything on board that isn't honouring my free will at and the end And that's of the very, day. very good. That's very good. Um, but I'd really, really like to know whether it's Jesus and I haven't found a clear one who can tell me yet. And why do you feel that is? Um, because they don't always reveal who they want to reveal to everyone. Wouldn't Jesus do that? Um, but Jesus don't was, know. Well, Jesus was the man, like, if I'm not Jesus, Jesus was the man mm. who said the truth will set you free. Mm. Did he not? Yep. So would, why would he ever withhold the truth from you? Uh, yeah, but why, how come another clairvoyant can't see? That's the question I want to know. Well, uh, um, this is something about clairvoyance that needs to be understood quite a lot. Many of us are automatically clairvoyant. The truth is that every single person on the planet could be clairvoyant yep. if they work through different emotions that block clairvoyance. Yep. But, but the average person who's clairvoyant, let's say, for many, it's a woman, right, many times. So, so let's draw a woman who's clairvoyant. She, her development is of critical importance as to what she can see and who she can communicate with. Mm -hmm. Now, if her personal spiritual development is in the first dimension, and by the way, you can be clairvoyant whether you're, like there are, there are, there are literally many people who are influenced by what we would call demons or very, very dark spirits, right? Yep. And they're clairvoyant. So you can be clairvoyant and be connected to any type of spirit you yep. want it just depends upon the condition of your soul so if that's where her soul is in, her, in its condition in the first dimension then the spirits that will be attracted to her primarily will also be in the same dimension she is mm -hmm. does that make sense to you yeah so so if she's in the first dimension in terms of her, her development in love she has not much of a respect for free will and she and she, you know, quite bossy at times and, you know, quite manipulative at other times and so forth. Well, what will happen is that the spirits attracted to her to talk with her will be spirits that surround that condition. And it will be very rare for her to get a spirit from the second dimension to talk with her. Okay. Does that make sense? So, and the reason why is because her own condition is going to determine who she associates with. It's a bit the same here on earth when you think about it. It's identical. Mm. You know, if, if I've got a heap of monk mates that are, that are, you know, drugged to the brain all the time and we're drinking all the time, we go out and have some fun, then the likelihood of a guy coming along who's a teetotaler who never drinks wanting to spend time with me is going to be pretty remote, right? 
Yeah, like mine. Yeah. So, so it's exactly the same. It's called the law of attraction. That's at work perfectly. So the law of attraction is working upon the soul condition of the medium. So if this person is clairvoyant or a medium, then what, who she is going to attract, whether she believes it or not, is going to be very much related to the condition she's in. Yeah. So you go along to a medium, you sit down, and maybe it's a seance or something, you sit down and you go along to and talk to, talk to some spirits, and these playful spirits come along and then, you know, who want to have jokes with you, they come along and talk through her, and then you know, another spirit comes along talking about, you know, what, what they had for dinner that day and what's going to happen to them tomorrow and all those kind of things. While it all might be very interesting, it's not very much benefit spiritually to every person that's present. And the reason why it's not benefit is because the medium herself is attracting those spirits to her. Yep. Yep. Now, if you want some really good books to read about all of this that were written a hundred years ago, so nothing to do with myself, they were written a hundred years ago. Uh, Robert James Lees was the medium who wrote them. And there's a series of books, and I think Joy, uh, the guys put it, is it on the Secrets of the Universe DVD? Which DVD is it on? All of them. Oh, on every DVD that you have, that, that there's a video, but there's also some book PDF files. Yeah. And there's three PDF files that he wrote that you can actually print out as a book if you want to read them, or you can read them on the computer. The first one is called Through the Mists. The second one is called The Life Elysian. And the third one is called The Gate of Heaven. All right. And they actually explain, many of them, the interaction that goes on between the earth and the spirit world. They actually explain that interaction that's happening. So, so on those DVDs you'll find those three books. And my suggestion is have a bit of a read of them because they explain a lot about the interactions between spirits and people on earth, even when people on earth don't really know what's going on. And, and they also explain, the, one of those books explains how a medium attracts around her the spirits, or him, the spirits that are close to his or her condition. Normally, that's the case. Now, not always, because sometimes higher spirits feel that the medium might be able to develop a bit further up where they can talk to them, and they sometimes surround that medium. But if the medium is very fixed in their ways and doesn't want to grow spiritually, then, then the medium, and when I say grow spiritually, I mean grow in love, you know, change their love state, if you like then the medium will often, while they might be a good medium, they will only attract people who are in very similar to condition to themselves. Cool. So are you holding me hand or not? <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a spirit holding your hand, certainly, yeah. and it's not Jesus. It's not me. And if I'm Jesus, then it's not, not me. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. But you need to decide who, who that is for yourself, really. Yeah. Um, I, feel, I feel quite strongly that you also have some other spirits around you yeah. um, that are influencing you very positively you know, towards God and towards truth in particular. You yeah, one's supposed <coughs> to be um, a mercy of angel. Yep. And the other one I, who recently came in claims he's Lord Maha, Maha Cohen. Yeah. And he holds my right hand. Yeah. Can you see how you've got two men holding each hand? Yeah, and but through this lifetime, I've been very tomboy, so it doesn't surprise me. Can you see why you've been very tomboy? Um, well, the angel of mercy has always been very feminine, and all, but has never bossed me around in any way, so it's just allowed my family's influence to allow me to be tomboyish. Yeah, you, you've actually been quite influenced all of your life by men's spirits. Okay. That's why you've been called a tomboy. The reality is that you're finding it very difficult to connect to your femininity as a result of their influence. Okay. Does that make sense? Now, the reason why they want to give you this protection is because you feel you need protection from a male very strongly. Yep. You follow? Yep. And as a result of that, you're attracting two men's spirits who are holding each of your hand, directing you in, through life in order to actually help you feel secure and safe. Okay. When you release the emotion inside of yourself of being secure and safe, 
then you won't need these two men holding your hands anymore. Okay. And for the first time also, you'll be far more feminine than you've been in the past. Yeah. And on top of that, you'll also attract your soulmate quite rapidly. Uh, so I I'm not with my soulmate. Well, what's happening is you've got two men holding your hands. But I've got a soulmate who's my opposite. Yeah. And I'm not Have about you? to let him go <laughs> because he's a bit perfect. <laughs> ah, but, but the truth is, how can you have a soulmate connection with one person when you've got two men holding your hands? Okay. You think about that. Okay. Can you see? Like, like, so, for example, if I wanted to connect to Mary and then at the very same... There she is over there. She's just disappeared from here. <laughs> uh, if I wanted to connect to Mary completely, any woman that I'm reliant upon is going to prevent a full connection between myself and Mary. So if I'm still connected to my mum in some way and reliant upon mum in some way, that's going to prevent my connection to Mary. If I'm reliant on some spirit friends who are, who are, my, who are females... Well, can I just ask, the, the guy I'm with now, we met when I was 16. You're not going to ask me whether he's your soulmate, are you? <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Well, no, we met when we were. Because I'm not going to ask. No, we, got, we met when we were. Oh, well, I was 16. He yeah. was 18. Yeah. And my angel, the um, her name's Mary, because mm -hmm. she's an um, an angel of mercy. Mm -hmm. um, I've had that told to me. Mm -hmm. She actually told me, her, and major major things that happened throughout my life. She's always been the one to tell me, not these male energies. Mm -hmm. um, and I she agree. she actually said that. When my sister broke us, broke me and my boyfriend up, mm -hmm. that by the time I was 30, we would be back together. And mm -hmm. I didn't doubt that for a second. Mm -hmm. And I was 29 when we met, when we met again. Oh, we bumped into each other here yep. and there. Yep. But we got back to get, I literally got together at 29. Yep. I was also told by her when I was 14 that I'd have cancer. Uh, a hysterectomy, but she wouldn't tell me why. Mm -hmm. And when I ha we had our, our baby daughter, which they told me I'd have my son and I'd have my baby daughter, and yep. all these things came from her. Yep. Um, which is um, why I've always thought, well, you know, in my prayers, I've always asked to have my soulmate, but I was also going to be. T I was also told that he'd be my opposite, and this guy is totally my opposite. And at the end of the day, I should leave him. But at the end, at the end of the day, he he's everything that you want in a person yep. that you stop yourself from experiencing. If that makes sense. So, in other words, he challenges your life. Yes. Which is really good, huh? Yes. Of course. So, very good. Um, you know, I've said many prayers to God about whether I should stay in this relationship. And again, it's always come back down to the free will. God has always said, yes, stay in the relationship. But at the end of the day, it's always been my choice. Can I suggest to you a few things that is happening around you, though? Yep. So, here's yourself. The, the woman who you call an a, the angel of mercy, Mary, yep. is actually not the woman she's proclaiming to be. Okay. However, she does have your interests at heart. But if you spoke to her openly or through a medium, you would actually be able to quite quickly determine who she actually is. Okay. And she's someone who lived in the last couple of hundred years, actually. She's not someone who's lived a long time in the spirit world. Yep. And, uh, but... but Rather than me say much more about it, you could easily investigate that through a medium or... Well, a whatever. medium actually told me who, this, who she was now, and that's why I'm claiming that she's saying that she is. Yeah, well, what's happened is the medium is in a condition where she can only connect to, like I'm saying here, to yep. her. And, and as a result of that, when she gets told something from a spirit, she automatically just relates it to you. Okay. She, she, she's not actually knowing whether that person or investigating whether that person is actually the person they're claiming to be. Okay. Now, I find this quite interesting in a lot of ways. Like, like I say I'm Jesus and people spend years and years of time even coming to even trust me a little tiny bit. Mm. And yet one person in the spirit world can say, I'm Mary, angel of mercy. And just because a medium says it to us, we believe it instantly. Now, does that make sense to you? No, I don't believe it, but I want to believe it if that makes sense. Ah, that's why it happens, you see. <laughs> you see, that's why it happens. We, we shouldn't believe things because we want to believe them. We need to actually find the truth about them. So you, you don't need to accept who I'm saying I am, for example, and, and in particular with spirits, you've got an additional problem, and that is they're invisible to you. 
Hmm. for most people. So if they're invisible to you, how are you ever going to determine who they are? The way to determine who they are is through feeling them and also discussing things with them if you have the opportunity. And when you ask details, you'll be able to feel when they're hedging around the subject or, you know, like people on Earth. You know, when you, mm. when you say to a person on Earth, oh, you know, what happened here? And you, you can feel them sort of hedging around that subject or trying to avoid that subject. Well, you know that there's more truth there, don't you? You know there's something else that's being hidden yeah. generally. It's the same with our conversation with spirits. The problem is that most mediums do not believe they can do that they don't believe that they can question anybody who comes to them and my suggestion is always question anybody who comes to you whether they're in the flesh in front of you or whether they're a spirit because at the end of the day we want to find out the truth and the only way to find out the truth is by questioning is by asking questions so what's happening around you is you've got these two men spirits standing right next to you. They're quite large, right? So I'm drawing them small, but they're like big fellas, right? Yeah. Protect you. They've been protecting you all of your life. Yeah. Okay. And, but unfortunately, the payback for them is they get to also experience some of the things you experience. They get to do some of the things they didn't do while on Earth. And this is why you've done, you know, your family sort of treats you like you're the tomboy of the family yep. in that you do things that sometimes a, a boy would do instead of what a girl would generally do. Yep. Does that make sense? And they've been influencing you. You've had this other girl protecting you as well, wanting yep. to guide you and protect you. And she in particular wants to guide you with your life love situation you know with what's happening there yep. and you have a medium tell you different things that's happening around you and then we go through this process of where we accept it all without question and not on I'm not saying that she told you the wrong thing what I'm saying is she doesn't know the full details of all of those people that are around you and therefore portrays them to be someone they're not because they themselves are portraying themselves to be someone they're not. Mm. And so she just reflects that to you. And the problem with just going along with it all is that it's like, again, abdicating your own will in the process. Yeah. Yeah. And so my suggestion again is to be very careful about abdicating your own will and also to look at why you want these men with you so much. Right? Yeah. And you want them with you so much because they make you feel safe and secure and protected. And they are the ones who give you that very strong, direct voice and manner. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. And you like that. You like having that feeling that it gives you because it feel, gives you a feeling of like, I've got things under control. Yes. It makes you feel safe. Yes. Yeah. And I'm saying to you that it would be better for you to actually deal with the emotion inside of you as to why you actually feel unsafe. Because there is an emotion inside of you where you do actually feel unsafe. Yeah, that's because of what I've been through in my life. I know. And, and if you allow yourself to fully feel those emotions, you will actually find that these two men you won't need anymore holding onto your hand. And for the first time, if you are with your soulmate or not, you will still attract him and actually be in a soulmate relationship for the okay. first time. Does that make sense? So here's yep. your soulmate, whoever he is. He might be the man you're with, right? Yep. But at the moment, you've got two men <laughs> holding, you're holding on their hands to so that you don't have to feel as much about this man as you, as you need to. Okay. Um, now another question: How do we get to know our future? If it's is it because the spirits know it already, or, or is that from God to them to pass on to you, or is it from God directly to pass on to you? Well, you must when remember when you have premonitions and all that sort of stuff as well. Sure. In the spirit world, there's a couple of things that happen. Firstly, every night you go to sleep, right? And we, you're a spirit when you're asleep. You, go, you actually leave your body, um, go out of your body, and you're in the sleep state in the spirit world every single night. Um, our body lays there resting, and we're out doing things in the spirit world every single night. Now, some of those events you may remember. Most people on Earth don't remember them because we're very, very close to the idea that we've actually got a spirit body and we've got a whole existence in our sleep. 
However, some of us, and particularly when we're little, when we're small children, generally we remember pretty much most of our experience. But as we grow up, that experience gets you know, eventually closed down and closed down and eventually we don't remember. So here we are, we're a, sp a spirit body now in the sleep state in the spirit world. Now, it's very easy for us to plan things about what's going to happen the next day in that state. We, we can even meet people in the spirit world and then plan to meet them the next day or the next week. And when you meet them, you go, gee, I'm sure I know you. I'm positive that I've met you. And highly likely you have in the sleep state, in the spirit world, if you have not met them on earth before. And, and so, firstly, we have the ability to plan our life when we're asleep as much as when we're awake. So that's the first thing. Secondly, there's no time in the spirit world in the sense that we think of time. And also, a spirit not only can see what's immediately in your own vicinity, but they can see the thoughts of every single individual around you. And as such, they can start to predict to a large degree of accuracy what you're going to do tomorrow mm -hmm. and who you're going to meet tomorrow, in fact. And not only tomorrow, but a year time and even sometimes depending on how predictable we are five years time or ten years time they can even look forward and see all of the interactions that are going to occur spirits are highly mathematical brains you know on earth we're only using what 10 percent or less of our brain in the spirit world you're using 100 percent of your brain Yep. Right. So you have the ability to analyze very, very rapidly and see all of the different things that are going on. Now, a spirit in the second sphere obviously has that capacity to a lesser extent than a spirit in the sixth sphere. And that spirit has a capacity to a far lesser extent than a spirit in the eighth dimension and so forth. But we still have the capacity. So what that means then is that I can drop thoughts into your mind or even tell you what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, ten years time. Given the set of situations that I see around you, your emotions, what you're thinking about, what the other people that are surrounding you that you have not even yet met, yet met are thinking about, their own situation, all those kind of things, and I can predict a lot of the future. Now, sometimes I'll get it wrong, and that's why when some spirits come and talk to a medium and the medium says, this is going to happen, and you go away and go, oh, that's interesting, and then six months later it still hasn't happened, 12 months later it still hasn't happened, right? Mm. And uh, in those kind of cases, then the spirit um, obviously didn't know all the facts and so therefore couldn't prevent, predict the events accurately. But the, but the stronger you, you know, the, the better the spirit is in terms of connection with love and connection with God, the more accurate their predictions are going to become. And in fact, the spirit who's in the 21st or 22nd dimension, which is high, much higher again, they can predict hundreds of years into advance what is going to happen. Okay. All right. So it becomes very, very easy then for them, if they can communicate that to a person on earth, it becomes easy for them to actually say to a person, this is going to happen in your life in five years' time, or this is going to happen in your life in two years' time. Now, you still have free will, and on top of that, if you deal with the different emotional conditions that create your attractions, you can change that event. So mm -hmm. let me give you an example of that. Um, I'll just say... There's a man I knew who lived over in Western Australia. He was staying with us and um, he was working for, one of my, for a friend of mine. And my, the, the friend of mine was a medium, a, a, a person who could talk to spirits. Does that make sense? Yep. So um, this friend one night got this message from a spirit saying that actually they would... Um, that he would die in a car accident within one month. Right? And my friend John just was very, very concerned about that. You know, like, so he, 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 we were talking about it and he's saying, what do I do? What do I do about that? Right? And what, he finished up, what I finished up saying to him is, look, tell the man. And tell the man why, you know, ask the spirit why would he die in a month. And the spirit told John that actually he'd die because there's a problem with his car and where the brake linings of the, the brake uh, um, hydraulics of, his, of, of, the, of the braking system in his car were so worn that within the next month they would break and he would have a very severe car accident and probably because he, he travelled on country roads 
it would be a very severe car accident and he'd probably die from it. Mm. Now, um, once the man, once John told the man, the man jacked up his car and had a look at the front end of his car and sure enough, the whole front end with regard to the brakes were all, were all badly frayed and damaged and he replaced them all. And, and now when John had another chat with the spirit, yeah, it's not going to happen now. So can you see how oftentimes the Spirit is giving us an indication of what may happen based on if we follow that course of action continually? So if the man never checked his car, high likelihood that event would have occurred. But now that the man's checked his car and, and fixed it all up, now that event doesn't occur. Yeah. Yeah. So, so many times spirits are actually telling us events of our future so that we can avoid them. But we then go, oh, that's, predi that's predestined for our future. And we don't change anything. And sure enough, that particular event occurs. Yeah. But, but oftentimes, if we allowed ourselves, we would actually see that we could actually change the event if we deal with certain law of attraction that comes from our soul that protracts those events. Yeah. So it's actually very powerful to speak more and get more clear knowledge. You see, a lot of people who are mediums, have this belief system that if I'm hearing something from a spirit, it means it's fixed in you know, concrete. I, I can't change that. Many people have that belief. Um, other people have the belief that it's not so much fixed in concrete, but it's highly unlikely that it's going to change. And many of other people too have a sort of an interest fascination where they almost create the event. So for example, if I say to you, oh, next week you're going to be in this particular situation, and I explain the situation in quite a bit of detail, now your own feelings are heightened about noticing that particular situation. Mm -hmm. So me telling you has automatically changed your behaviour. Yep. Does that make sense? So this is why spirits who are much higher spirits generally will not tell you about events of the future because they want you to exercise your free will. To, they want you to enable your passions and desires and exercise your free will. They generally don't disclose things about the future because they, they only do it when your life is in danger generally. And, and that's when they generally do let you know what's going on. But unfortunately, we then think, well, our spirit's telling me what's going to happen in the future. This spirit must know everything. And we automatically make the assumption that no matter where they are in the spirit world, they must know everything. And then, and then we make the mistake of then going along with these choices and decisions that are actually being made by somebody else. Mm -hmm. In other words, we give up our free will. Mm -hmm. we, we actually now have become, we're now doing something the spirit's saying to us rather than what we've decided to do with our life. So, so my feelings are more along the lines of God created you to exercise your own free will. God created you too with these, with these inbuilt desires. There's, one primary, there's a couple of primary desires. One primary desire is for you to meet a mate. Yep. And in particular to meet your soulmate. We had this discussion, Glenn and myself, last night, you know, just how, you know, soulmate, the soulmate desire leads us in all sorts of directions. He, he was saying a very interesting comment, how even the car that he bought was because he wanted to meet his soulmate, you know, and show off a car sort of thing. So, you know, that, that's, that primary desire drives many of our actions in the course of a day, actually. There's also a primary desire in our life of, of connecting with God. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that primary desire, if it's unrecognised, uh, will often cause us many problems where we connect to other people, you know, substituting them for God, basically. And, and there are many other desires and passions that each of us have that are unique. So some of you have a passionate desire for music. Some of you have a passionate desire for art. Some of you have a passionate desire for both. You know, some of you have a passionate desire for engineering, you know, electronics all sorts of different things and God in built in us specific desires that are part of our personality as a part of our original pristine condition but how we act upon those things is dependent on, on our free will totally so how does God help you overcome fear the most destructive emotion <coughs> there is well, certainly not by suppressing it, as you do. <laughs> <All right? laughs> so what, what you've done is you've got these two fellas next to you who help you <laughs> stay away from your fear altogether, right? Yeah. So, so, yeah, that doesn't help you with your fear. 
fear is, uh, after a while, if we allow ourselves to feel about it, fear is just another emotion. Yeah. So fear is just another emotion like, you know, like grief or shame or some other emotion. The problem with fear is that it is so, um, it's, it's fairly insidious emotion in the sense that usually we're afraid of fear. Mm -hmm. we're, we're so afraid to feel fear itself. Mm -hmm. And so, and fear when you feel it looks pretty bad. Like, so you'd be shaking and you look like you've got Alzheimer's sometimes, you know, you'd be, you, you'd be shaking or what's that other, Parkinson's. Parkinson's disease, you know, like when I was about 30 and going through a lot of fear, I was often asked the question from anybody who saw me, have you got Parkinson's? You know, like, no, it's just fear. You know, like you keep, you keep having to say the same thing over and over. And it's just fear that I've got to process through. And the problem with, with having a fear of fear is that we believe we can't experience fear. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, if you stay in your body, you will definitely be able to experience fear with God's help. You will always experience fear, be able to experience fear. Fear and terror, terror, which is the you know, most difficult part of fear to experience. Many of us have a lot of deep terrors that have been inbuilt within us. Mm. And the reason why we have deep terrors, you know, is because we've had these situations in our life that are terrifying. You know, let's face it, most of us at some point have probably been involved in an accident, for example, of some kind. You know, whether it was as a child when we fall out of a tree or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they are terrifying events for us. Also, many of us have had parents who have been quite violently oppressive, you know. Like, so, you know, your mum says to you, Dad's coming home. You know, he'll give you a belt when he comes home. And what does the child do? It goes into terror for the rest of the day, waiting for the, you know, this dread, this dread of Dad coming home and giving him a whack, you know. And so... We, we have a lot of these unhealed childhood events which cause us to believe that terror has to be prevented at all costs. When we believe and when we feel from God the help that we get, which we can get, and we're willing and open to feel the experience in our body of terror, then we will feel it. And when we feel it, it gets released from us in the process of feeling it. I sort of like an emotion being filled. It's like, if you imagine emotion like water being poured through the body, right, coming in from the top, just being poured through the body, whenever you hold, stop the feeling of it, wherever you stop the feeling of it is where it will generally reside. So for many people with fear, they stop the feeling of it. Uh, fear generally is felt all the way through this area here. And when we stop the feeling of it, we stop breathing, we contract our breathing, we can no longer get really deep breaths, we don't breathe into our diaphragm anymore. Most people I've met rarely breathe into their diaphragm, they usually breathe into their chest and therefore lots of extra air isn't right going into the body because we're not getting oxygenated, that causes its own problems. The fear itself is a contraction in that area and it causes all sorts of physical ailments all through all through that area when we're ready to feel our fear when we decide we're going to feel it and and it's and it's not about um sort of browbeating yourself into feeling it it's more about just letting yourself feel the body experience of it then the fear will just pass through you and you'll feel it pass through you like you'll go through the experience and when you come out the other side you enter a state of peace and it's not a temporary state of peace where it's just happened that one day. It will be a permanent state of peace where you realise the next day it's not there either. And the next day it's not there either. And the next day it's not there either. And that's when you know you've actually released that particular terror or that particular fear. The problem is that most of us uh, have a fear of feeling fear. Yes. And so we shut that down. We want other people around us to nurse us through the process of fear. We usually then attract spirits around us who try to help us avoid our fear. And, and in the end, we, we have all these barriers to experiencing fear. Unfortunately, fear is above our grieving emotions as well. And so we never get to experience our grief either, which means we never get to really change. So many people live their entire life on earth with lots of grief in them, with a lot of fear covering over the top of that grief. And it's only in the spirit world, after they've been in the spirit world many years, that they finish up releasing some of that. The fear of death is still, and particularly the fear of a violent death, is probably mankind's greatest fear still on the planet. And it locks up the entire body in many cases. 
Yeah. So if you feel like you're walking around feeling pretty peaceful and life's pretty darn good, yeah. but subconsciously you notice things in your dream that are displaying some negatives or some anger or fear bits and all the rest of it, is that um, you know necessarily meaning that you're definitely not having a good life on the outside? Yeah. Dreams are always generally telling you what you're denying in your awake state. So, so once you, so if you find you, you feel pretty good in your weight state, but you have a lot of dreams where you're being chased around the place, right? Then what's really happening is you have a lot of fear about, you know, being constantly chased or you know, somebody harming you in your awake state, but you're not letting yourself feel it. And so what you will do is you will dream it. And it's the same with shame, same with anger, rage, and a lot of other emotions. So take particular note of what you dream about, because what you dream about tells you what you're denying while you're awake in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Now, there are two kinds of dreams. There's a second kind of dream, which is a memory of your sleep state experience. So I'm not talking about those particular dreams. I'm talking about dreams where you wake up in an emotion. Like you make up in an emotion of fear or you wake up in an emotion of terror or you wake up in an emotion of shame. You know, you feel terribly ashamed because you just dreamed about having sex with somebody else that's not your partner or something like that. You know, these dreams are telling you the emotion you're denying. They're not telling you that you wanted to have sex with that person. They're telling you the emotion you deny, which is the shame, the feeling of sometimes sexual shame that you have that you're denying, for example, as an example. So um, the dreams are very, very helpful in helping you realise what particular emotions you're denying. Yeah. Can I... What's the time? It's already 7.40. Okay. Um, shall we ask, answer one more question and then have a break? Can we come back up here? Thanks. Yeah, um, why, why does God allow the spirits in the spirit world to impact on the spirits that are in, in the in the uh, physical world, in a body, and do the do the spirits that come into the newborn are they new spirits or are they recycled spirits? <laughs> okay, good questions, both of them. Um, firstly, why does God allow spirits to influence us while we're in a human form? The answer is. Uh, God has perfectly set up her universe in such a way that the law of attraction works perfectly at all times. Now the law of attraction is a specific law that is governed by our own soul condition. So it's actually our own soul that attracts certain things or repels certain things from it. And, and God set up that law so that it would show us what we need to work through to, if we want to be closer to God or, or also want to have a happy life. Now, spirits and people on earth, from God's perspective, are exactly the same thing. You know, they don't, God doesn't see spirits and people on earth as being different. To, to each other. They're all children of God. They all have a very, very similar makeup with the exception that a spirit has died. So in other words, they've gone through this process of death on the earth and they're now living in a different body. That's the only difference between a spirit and a person on earth. Now that being the case, God is not concerned about whether it's a spirit influencing us or another person on earth influencing us. If the law of attraction is working perfectly, then whoever, whatever my soul is open to experiencing will attract those particular spirits. Now in the case I gave down here, the two male spirits standing next to her they are spirits who are with her, attracted to her, because she feels she needs protection, a male's protection. And so these two men spirits come and actually connect with her and, and make her feel safe and secure. Because she, her own soul, is attracting it because her own soul doesn't want to feel her own fear. And so what she's doing is she wants a male to help her feel safe and secure so she doesn't have to feel her own fear. Now if there is no male available in this in the awake state, if you like, in the, in the physical sense, um, then these two men feel very, very honoured to, to do that particular thing for her. But it, it is her own soul that attracts that particular event. And my, my suggestion is rather than worry too much about what spirits are attracted and what spirits aren't, is to understand that everything that happens in our lives are an attraction based around our own soul and its condition and what it needs to work through and release. 
And once we understand that, it's a very powerful tool that can help us progress all the way through our life. So that was the first question. What was the second one? I can't remember it now. Um, does, does a newborn baby, for instance, get a new soul or, or a new spirit or a recycled spirit? Yeah, a newborn baby um, is, uh, up until very recently, a newborn baby is, is just a newborn soul in a new, in a new body. So when a, when a mother becomes pregnant, the half of the soul incarnates and attaches itself to the developing child. Right? And the developing child has two bodies that it attaches to. So there's the soul that's now attached to these two developing bodies. So in this case, I've drawn a woman's body with the feminine part of the soul being attracted. So that then becomes the baby. The baby is actually a physical body and a spirit body developing in the womb of mum connected to the soul. Now, while that's happening... so. That's sometimes happening inside mum's tummy, right? <laughs> if I can draw it like that. Right? <laughs> Do you want to add more detail? No, no, I think it's not good. Um, so that's happening inside of mum's tummy, right? Uh, the developing child. Now, unfortunately, part of the influences now upon this child are very much reflected upon mum because inside of this body here, which is mum's big body, so I'll draw mum's big body, all right, so this is mum's big body, there's her tummy, right? So that's mum. Right? She has a spirit body of her own and she is connected to her half of the soul. You follow? So she is actually now having a developing fetus inside of her own soul container which is, inside, which is outside of or enveloping the two bodies that she has. Now because of that, any influences she is open to automatically predisposes the child to be open to those same influences. So if the mother is frightened, like she has fear in her, it doesn't matter what it's about. Let's say she's afraid of men. If mum's afraid of men and this child here is a man being developing inside of mum's body, then he will feel like mum's afraid of me. Does that Make sense? If, if mum is afraid of men and this is a woman, a girl child developing inside of mum's body, then her soul will automatically start absorbing that emotion. I should be afraid of men, will automatically be absorbed. So this is why it's very important as a parent to work your way through things emotionally because when you release things emotionally, you'll find your children don't have the same predisposition towards the same emotions and, and therefore the same experiences. Now, unfortunately, also what happens is if the mother is afraid of spirits, for example, or has a deep underlying fear of spirits, or, or even just a deep underlying fear, period, what happens is spirits around her could then attach themselves to that developing fetus. All right? And this often does happen where by the time the child is born, it already is experiencing sickness and hurt from the attachment of a spirit who now is attempting to use the body and in fact the teaching of reincarnation as it's taught on earth today encourages spirits to do this so what the spirit is trying to do is attach to this body thinking that the spirit itself is going through a process of reincarnation when in reality what's happening is the spirit is just attaching itself to another person's body and sometimes you'll see um, and I've heard very frequently and seen very frequently where a child is born and they say, boy, he just reminds me of his uncle who passed away five years earlier, you know? And he just reminds me so much. He's just exactly the same. He's just exactly the same. And most of the time it's because there is actually the spirit of the uncle connecting to the child. And unfortunately, it's also a cause of many childhood diseases. So, for example, your leukemia in a child is frequently caused by a parent, a grandparent or a great-grandparent who died of cancer connecting to the child while it's either within the womb or shortly after birth and that is creating the cancer in the child. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, how would a parent stop that? Um, the parent needs to firstly understand that this is a potential of happening and secondly needs to deal with the emotion that allows the spirit to connect. So usually emotions like fear is one of those emotions. If I have fear in me, then fear is definitely going to leave or expose myself and my own children. If I'm carrying a child, it will expose those those things to those influences of the, these spirits who want to reattach. Because there are many spirits in the spirit world in these lower dimensions who believe they have to reattach to progress. The truth is, you can progress in the spirit world as much as you want without returning to earth. But many spirits don't believe that. Many spirits believe that you must um, reincarnate on earth to progress to the next level in the spirit world. And as a result of that, they, per they try to connect to people on earth uh, through this process and a lot of times try to connect to the child while it's even in the womb of the mum. And it's only the mum and dad's emotional condition that determines whether that can occur or not. So if mum and dad are both afraid of spirits, there's a high likelihood it will occur. If mum and dad both have a lot of fear in them, there's a high likelihood it will occur, for example. So mum and dad, before they have children, hopefully, hopefully deal with some of that fear and you'll have far less occurrence of any damage to the child through spirit influence. Yeah. Does that help? That's just giving you some examples of it, yeah. All right, well, let's have a break, shall we? And there's, I know there's some food out there and you guys might feel like warming up a little, so have a cuppa. So uh, let's have a break for about a half an hour or so, shall we?